how to decide which of the hundreds of concepts about words and language to include in the museum. That was my next big challenge and really by far the most important one. What we decided to include in the museum would make or break its reputation and whether visitors found it fun or interesting or worthwhile. To help Patty and me decide on content, we conducted an RFP of museum design firms, which only design firms that tended to use technology in their exhibit designs. We ended up choosing local projects based in New York City. They had just completed the interactive exhibits at the 9-11 Memorial Museum, and they were known for the interactive art wall at the Cleveland Art Museum and the exhibits they designed at the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian's Design Museum. We told them that whatever they designed had to share some combination of the six core values that we decided on. Our six core values to repeat, they had to share some combination of these six core values, fun, playful, unexpected, motivational, meaningful, and inclusive. One original value that I had suggested, comprehensive, was dropped. Patty warned me that I could never cover everything comprehensively and shouldn't try, and boy, was she right. But there are two of these six values that I argue and argued then had to be represented in everything we did. Content had to be meaningful and inclusive. There had to be a reason why a topic was included when space was at such a premium. And I wanted to make sure that anyone visiting the museum would find something that spoke to them or reflected their background or interests. That meant any books or poems or speeches or songs that we included had to reflect the diversity of America, of the people who lived in Washington, had to reflect diversity of points of view, sexual orientation, age, genre, and topic. Local projects then asked me what age group or target audience would be. And they told us that as designers, they needed to plan for a specific age group in order to tailor the language they used in scripts and the type of activities they designed. Couldn't just be a museum for everybody. They, for as designers, they had to think about a particular age group. So we chose that 10 to 12 year old cohort. Why? Because we felt that's the age when kids typically decide whether to be readers or seek other forms of entertainment. If we were to achieve our mission, which was to inspire and renew a love of words, language and reading, that was the age group that we needed to target. And moreover, kids at that age have the social emotional development to think about others, to be empathetic and understand how their words can hurt or heal. Here is a slide with our mission. So Planet Word will inspire and renew a love of words, language and reading in people of all ages. Too many kids turn off to reading because they don't see themselves or their interests reflected in the pages they're asked to read or the characters or the situations depicted on the pages. Maybe they prefer to read graphic novels or write rap lyrics or perform spoken word or do stand up routines and write speeches, all authentic activities that promote literacy and an awareness of words. So that's what we try to enable at Planet Word. We make sure that each gallery has a diverse content that will engage every visitor 
no matter what excites them. We want to ensure that all visitors feel recognized and valued, not intimidated or marginalized, that they see themselves represented at the museum. Taking into account the Franklin School's three main floors, we divided the exhibit content into three overarching themes, how we acquire language, and the characteristics of those languages. That's the sort of orange stripe, our world of words, that's on our third floor. What we can do with words, that's the pinkish purple magenta stripe inspired by words, and the power of words, that's the green stripe, and that's on our first floor. Breaking those themes down even further, local projects developed exhibits on early childhood language, childhood language acquisition, etymology, languages around the world, songwriting, humor, oratory, imagery, poetry, advertising, copywriting, and the impact of words on people's lives. In addition, we designed many auxiliary exhibits on topics such as linguistic bias, animal communications, media literacy, and endangered languages. Those supplemental interactives now number 19, and we've got ideas for about 10 more on everything from speech language pathologies to polling and testing languages. In an Amazingly original approach, local projects proposed that we create a largely voice activated museum, a museum where visitors voices would determine to a great extent the course of the visit they'd have at Planet Word and what they would learn. That means that no two visitors would experience the museum in exactly the same way. In fact, their experience would be determined by their choices and their voices. And how appropriate we thought that a museum about words would encourage visitors to listen and speak and engage in a conversation with the exhibits themselves. Here's our entry sign with our tagline. I hope you agree that we've created a museum that lives up to its tagline, the museum where language comes to life. And we've accomplished this while staying true to all our six core values, chief among them, that inclusivity that I mentioned earlier. We've incorporated that value into every experience and even built it into the infrastructure of the museum not just the all important content of the galleries, but it's demonstrated by our free general admission, by the diverse voices you hear, by the artwork on display, by the terrazzo floor that you walk on, by the bathroom walls and the lockers that are decorated with the International Phonetic Alphabet, and here you see our, one of our bathrooms. We have bathrooms on restrooms on all five floors of the museum and each level is uh, decorated with a different theme. And here, you know, we're languages, uh, words from all different languages around the world for toilet. And um, we were actually nominated as one of, uh, 10 uh, museum facilities and well, not just museums, restaurants too, but restroom, the 10 best restrooms in the United States. Um, we uh, didn't win, but we got a lot of publicity about our restrooms. And some of them are, are very funny and they have like phrases from Shakespeare or to pee or not to pee. And, Farting is such sweet sorrow. So we have um, one set of restrooms that's tiled with phrases in all different languages for where's 
the bathroom where's the where's the loo so um it's it's fun and and that just shows how we we tried to find a place everywhere we could not just in exhibit galleries to bring words and language to life and we also now have a an in-house restaurant we don't run it but they occupy a space and lease it from us and it's um, immigrant food so even the restaurant really ties closely to our values of inclusivity a typical visit to the museum begins on the third floor and ends on the ground floor. To get upstairs, you can walk up our beautifully restored stairs or take elevators that are lined with photographic murals of books that are actually in our magical library books that come to life. So no matter which way you choose to go upstairs, it's a pretty awesome journey. The heart of the museum is at the start of the visitor journey. It's our gallery called Where Do Words Come From? This gallery features a 1,000 word, three-dimensional talking word wall. It's 40 feet wide and 22 feet tall. It tells the story of how words came to be part of the English lexicon, and it tells that through an animated sound and light show that's shaped by the choices of the visitors in the room and the words that they choose to hear about. The main message we want visitors to take away from the experience is that language, especially English, is always changing and evolving. That there was never a time when English was perfect and every change of usage or meaning or pronunciation since that time has been a decline. No, we want to celebrate the innovations and borrowings that create the rich, inventive English that we use today. You could say the word wall is fundamentally an etymology exhibit, but it's not like anything you've ever seen or heard before and definitely not like leafing through a dictionary. We've created a non-didactic, participatory, colorful experience that's truly inspiring. So you might be wondering, how did we select those particular thousand words for the word wall? And really the answer is we wanted to answer the question, where do words come from? So we chose words that are great examples of how our language is constantly evolving, which is the single most important concept that we want visitors to leave with. So first we identified about 28 different ways that words enter English, but that's way more than visitors would ever have the patience or stamina to hear about, no matter how entertaining. So we narrowed that list down to eight main ways, including how war and conquest have had a huge impact on the evolution of English, how we borrow words from other languages and take them for our own, how we clip long words, and how we constantly invent new words like portmanteaus and onomatopoeia. Then we chose exemplar words from each category. Words that had amusing backstories that lent themselves to projection imagery and sound effects. For example, burrito is on the word wall, one of those words we borrowed from Spanish. Its origin was probably burro, the Spanish word for donkey. So when visitors hear choose to hear about that word, they watch a donkey piled high with rolled up blankets, plod across the word wall, and they hear braying in the background. They learn that burrito, that word probably reminded people, or no, that 
burritos, the objects, probably reminded people of those rolled up blankets on a donkey's back. And that's probably where the word comes from. We made sure all the words on the wall had similarly compelling backstories so visitors would have so much fun learning that they wouldn't even notice that they were being taught something. So now I'm gonna to try to play the, a little video clip of that donkey plodding across the wall and we'll see if that works. Burrito. That delicious Mexican dish comes from the Spanish word for donkey, which is burro. Some people say it's because burritos look like a rolled up bundle you might see on the back of a donkey. We borrowed hundreds of words from Spanish. So that gives you a little idea of what it's like to experience our Where Do Words Come From gallery and what the word wall does and how it's interactive. So the second important gallery is housed in the fresco lined spacious grade hall, the Franklin School's one time assembly room. To bring language to life here, local projects proposed hanging an interactive 12 foot diameter globe from the 22 foot high ceiling. It's covered by 4,800 LEDs that light up designs related to the lessons visitors are learning from 30 language ambassadors. Their native speakers of their language filmed in a New York studio reading scripts that we wrote and researched about their native language. The language ambassadors speak to visitors from 15 iPads circling the globe. You're probably wondering how we ever whittle down the world's 6,000 plus spoken languages into the 28 plus two sign languages that we spotlight. And here's another picture of the globe lit up and with uh, a language ambassador from an Aboriginal uh, group in Australia. Here's Hillary, Here, she's our Irish ambassador. So go back to Hillary. So how did we choose which languages to feature? Well, we knew that we had to feature commonly spoken languages that any visitor would expect to hear, French, German, Spanish, Russian, Mandarin, Chinese. But we also wanted to include examples of indigenous languages, rare languages, endangered languages, and languages spoken by the DC immigrant community, the people who would be very likely uh, to be our visitors. And third, we needed to choose languages that were evenly geographically distributed around the globes because as you saw, the iPads are circling our globe chandelier. And the fourth factor that we had to consider was the traits of each language. Because for each language we created and wrote too many lessons. We had to come up with its a language's most unique and interesting features and we didn't want those features to overlap from language to language. One of my favorite examples is what visitors learn from our Quechua ambassador. Their concept of the future, as you might know, is something that lies behind you because you haven't seen it yet. And likewise in Quechua, the past is ahead of you because you've already seen it. Just the opposite of English, where we say the future lies ahead of us and the past behind. Examples like these keep visitors intrigued and eager to go from iPad to iPad to see what fascinating lessons await. And another fun language is given by our Hebrew ambassador. One of the many lessons that she gives is about the guttural chet sound in Hebrew. She encourages visitors to try Hebrew words that use that letter, ending with the toast l'chaim. So when visitors say l'chaim, 
they're asked to look up that there a message uh, comes across the iPad screen and says look up and when they look up at the globe they'll see it lit up like two champagne glasses they'll hear sounds of the champagne glasses clinking and it's such a positive joyful reinforcement for you know rewarding people for trying to say something in an unfamiliar tongue on the second half of on the second floor of the museum all the exhibits are devoted to what we can do with words so songwriting in our karaoke style gallery to humor writing to oratory to storytelling and poetry on this floor the most memorable gallery is surely our magical library shown here where we really do bring books to life through magical projection technology we chose 50 books that met our standards for diversity and each one comes to life in a unique way through art um, and motion, sound and narration. Visitors basically hear a little movie trailer about each book that's designed to make them want to read the book. And so nothing makes me happier than when a visitor, especially a young visitor, especially a young male visitor comes up to me and asks, if we sell those books in at the museum? And the answer is yes. We sell all the books that come to life in our gift shop, as well as all the poetry that you can hear in our poetry nook. On the ground floor, oh, I forgot. I'm going to show you how the books come to life. So in the middle of the gallery is what we call our story table. And there and throughout on the walls, on the bookshelves, any book that is facing out where you can see the book jacket, you can take off the shelf and put in a special holder and watch it come to life. So here's an example of that happening. Long Way Down is the story of a young man named Will Holloman who loses his older brother to gun violence. And the next day, is thrust into a situation where he's forced to make a really complicated decision. His neighborhood has given him rules and codes to abide by. No crime, no snitching, and you always see revenge. And so as Will gets on the elevator on the eighth floor to ride down to the ground floor to seek revenge, possibly uh, he is faced with visitors. Um, and each of these visitors that get on the elevator, he's very familiar with. So that was uh, the book Long Way Down, narrated by the author, Jason Reynolds, who is the National Ambassador for Children's Literature from the Library of Congress. He's also on our advisory board. By the end of their visit, we hope that visitors to Planet Word will be more aware of the words they use, of the words used around them, that they'll gain empathy for people who don't sound like them, and that they'll be better equipped to navigate our increasingly globalized city, country, and world. We think our voice-triggered exhibits and participatory approach truly bring language to life for our visitors. We love hearing laughter and singing and reading reverberating from all our galleries not to mention people talking to the word wall or trying out a few words of Farsi or Zulu or Hawaiian. We've, we think we've made this magic happen and we sure hope you'll come visit soon and see for yourself and add your visits and your voices to our world, to Planet Word. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, uh, Anne. It's, Thank uh, you as always.